Good evening, everyone. And my name is Winoka Yepa. I am Danette from the Navajo Nation, coming from Chicago, New Mexico. And I am the new Senior Manager of Museum Education here at um, IAIA Mokna. And so I just wanted to thank all of you for coming this evening um, for our artist talk with Peter Jennison. Um, so Peter Jennison is Seneca of the Heron Clan. Um, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Arts Education and an Honorary Doctorate of Fine Art from Buffalo State College. His works are included in major collections, such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Heard Museum in Phoenix, the Denver Art Museum, the British Museum in London, and of course the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum, as well as many others. <laughs> um, Jerson is also an esteemed curator and writer and in 2004 was elected board member at large of the American Alliance of Museums and was the founding director of the American Indian Community House Gallery in New York City. So Jimison's exhibition, which you are all surrounded by, uh, features beautiful colored pencil drawings and 3D works that were created in preparation for his film, The Iroquois Creation Story, which will also be screened in this gallery, as you can see. Um, so the official opening of the exhibition is actually not until tomorrow, so all of you are actually getting the sneak peek. <laughs> um, and so um, we will have an opening, a soft opening tomorrow, and it will be up until March 15th of next year. So definitely come back and see it in its entirety. Um, so just please join me in welcoming Peter Jensen. It's the language I'm speaking. It's, uh, it would translate the language of the people of the Great Hill. In our language, we don't refer to ourselves as Seneca because the word has no meaning. But in English, we're called Seneca. And we're part of a larger confederacy called the Haudenosaunee, meaning Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora, six nations. And um, so my wife, Jeanette, is joining me tonight. And Jeanette is a member of the Kanyapihaga of the Mohawk Nation. And uh, so I just want to thank the Institute of the American Indian Arts for inviting me to uh, exhibit here. And everyone who has been connected with uh, organizing this, I uh, appreciate very much the work you have done. And uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm in the land of the you know, enchanted sun, right? <laughs> and all the people who, who call this home, I want to thank them as the source of this beautiful land where I'm visiting this time. Um, it was mentioned that I, you know, being the uh, Bachelor of Science in Art Education. And so I had really a very classical kind of a training. I always mention that, meaning I learned to draw, I learned to paint in various mediums, you know, oil paint, uh, acrylic, casing, wash, you know, uh, I used all these different mediums. And we used to have to take uh, sculpture, and pottery, we took uh, jewelry making, uh, Woodworking, there were all kinds of classes that we took, photography, and uh, then we took academics. And really, I, I focused also on art history to the extent that I, I went to the University of Siena, in Siena, Italy, to really spend a half a year traveling around looking at Renaissance art in, uh, throughout Italy. And so, you know, with this kind of very classical training, um, for me, drawing was important. It, today, it seems like kind of a, I guess almost like an antiquated art, you know, to do any drawings. Uh, today, we visited, what is the name of that place? Uh, uh, oh, Meow Wolf. Wolf, you know, and there's not a lot of emphasis on drawing at Meow Wolf. <laughs> a lot of different kinds of medium, you know, that are being used. And, and that's not to criticize, it's just, uh, you know, I'm still 
focused on things like drawing and, and painting, and that uh, seems sort of, I don't know, at times such a, uh, you know, an old form, like a really old form. I was just not too long ago, about a month ago in Amsterdam, you know, and to go there and to see paintings by Rembrandt, various Dutch artists, you, you realize this history, how far back it goes, you know, about the 1600s, people working there like this. And then when I was in Italy, we were talking 1300s, 1400s, people you know, working in, the, in these mediums that I have chosen. Um, so all of my training though, I never really learned anything about my own traditions, nothing. And we weren't even mentioned you know, in, in any kind of school, any kind of classes, from elementary clear up to college. And so um, it was only as an adult that I began to have this uh, a yearning to learn about what it means to be on the walk. And, and this was really prompted by one of my teachers at the time. He said, you know, when you call yourself on the walk, well, it means you have a language. It means you have songs and dances that belong to us. It means that you have knowledge of the trees and the plants. And you have the knowledge of medicine. And, and there are ceremonies that belong to us. And there are arts and crafts. And all of this belongs to us. And it will take you a lifetime to learn about this. I mean, you're not going to learn about this in any kind of way. Know, short form. And so I was very blessed because um, I got hired by my nation, by the Seneca Nation, to manage what we call the education program back in those days. And, and my part of it was, first of all, to get our counselors into our, what we call contract with schools, the schools that educated our children. And then the second part of that was to begin a kind of a cultural uh, revitalization on, the, on our territory. And I, I lived and grew up at Cataraugus, which is one of uh, three Seneca reservations that are part of the Seneca Nation of Indians, the other being Allegheny. So my father came from Cataraugus, my mother's family came from Allegheny. And so in the beginning, I was setting up cultural programs. So that meant I would go out and hire a woodcarver. I would go out and hire a woman who knew how to work with cornhouse craft. I knew I would hire people who uh, cooked our traditional foods. I would hire people who spoke our language, people who sang our dances and our, you know, uh, taught the, sang our songs and taught the dances. And I, you know, I got to know all of these individuals personally because I mean I had to work with them, and they insisted that I, you know, I attend the classes and I learned along with everybody else that was learning, which was good for me. Well, then one a person who was running the uh, education program on the Allegheny Territory, she. Uh, she quit, and when she quit, then I became in charge of both territories. So now I had to go and hire a whole another group of people who taught singing and dancing and spoke the language and you know the cry carvers and whatever the basket makers, whatever it was they did, and then convinced them that they should actually teach in a kind of a formal way, which is not the way it really is passed along. You know, it's passed from maybe grandma to a granddaughter. Or her daughter and you know father to son and things like that and now I'm saying you know we're gonna have people come to this workshop and you're going to kind of teach them well they weren't teachers as such they were knowledgeable they had all the skills so you know this was a kind of a, a, a trial you know to figure out how the best way was to because what they mainly wanted to do was just work and let other people watch and when they had a question would ask a question so you know then in addition, there were other contemporary artists that I was working with. One of them went to the Institute of American Indian Arts, Peter, Peter Jones, and another Carson Waterman from Seneca. And then I you know, gradually reached out to other contemporary artists. And I began to curate exhibits of our contemporary arts. I would travel to each of our communities and I'd ask them, like, who's, who's the best artist or who's the artist that really recognizes here? Like say, Akwasasini or Ramadan or Tonawanda or Tuscarora or wherever it was. And then after I uh, either bought or I rented the work from them, I had a van. I built these exhibit cases and I started traveling those little exhibits of our, of our artists around from territory to territory, maybe through the 
uh, to the school or to the community center or wherever there was a place to hang the work and set it up. And that meant having to go to the to the nation's government and say, you know, you're okay with that, bring this in and, and uh, hey, set it up here. Anyway, that that was sort of the beginning, and then finally I, I took the exhibit to New York City and uh, I put it up in a, in a gallery in Soho, which was sort of an art capital, you know, at that time. And a friend of mine named Lloyd Oxen died and ran this gallery. Um, so then eventually, uh, you know, I left the community and left the work after a while and uh, wound up back in New York City. I had gone there right out of college for a year. I went back to New York City and I started running a community health gallery. And, um, and I did that for seven years and I mounted exhibits of contemporary artists from all over the U.S. Really. Some from Canada and even showed like Bolivian or Indian weaving, you know, as well at that gallery. And uh, and that really, you know, kind of again introduced me to so many people countrywide and it got me involved in all kinds of things, organizing, organizing, uh, you know, uh, ways to kind of keep our traditions going and, and keep uh, people, you know, show, giving them the ability to show the work they were doing. But um, in 1985, I had got sick of living in New York City and you know the cost of it, and the, you know I guess you could just say the pace of everything. And being so far from home, being away from the ceremonies, I would have to travel home just whenever I could to, to attend to our ceremonies. And so I came back home and uh, went to work at, at a place called, at the time it was called Ganagero. It's the site of a 17th century Seneca town where my people lived from 1655 to 1687, when a campaign of the French came through to wipe us out. And our, our people had to uh, flee there and, and move further east from where we were living. Um, but I, I went to work there as the manager of this uh, land, and uh, eventually we built a replica of a bark rum house, the kind of housing our people lived in in the 17th century. and. Um, just, just this summer, we replaced the roof on that. It's been up for 20 years now. And then in uh, 2015, um, I finally, after about 20 years of the dream, I finally got built a Seneca Art and Culture Center. And uh, it's a large building with uh, gallery space, classrooms, an auditorium, an orientation theater, offices, gift shop, and uh, you know, a theater's kitchen, and, and various other things that. We never had it before at that site. It was mainly an outdoor site. A lot of our, a lot of our activities were under a tent uh, throughout the good, the good months of the year. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I was actively doing, was working on raising the money, finding an architect, you know, getting all of these agreements done. Uh, Ganond again is part of the New York State Office of Parks, and so I had to work with, the, with Albany and, and work with parks. <coughs> Excuse me. So for the uh, for the new building, we have an orientation theater, and I, and I wanted to make a new film uh, to show in the orientation theater, and, and that led to the Iroquois creation story. And I, I had a I had a cousin. His name was John Mohawk, and he was a Seneca scholar. And John had really gotten into a, uh, a version of the creation story that was first recorded in, uh, well, I should say a written record of it, in uh, 1898. And the, and the person who told the story was a man named Chief John Arthur Gibson, and he was Seneca. He related this story to a, a Tuscarora anthropologist known as J.M.B. Hewitt. And this is a very complicated story. First of all, it was related to Hewitt in Onondaga, and then it took Hewitt almost uh, 27 years to finally translate it into English and then set it down in the 20s. But when he did that, he kind of used a very old form of the way people speak and were speaking English at that time. <clears throat> so to read this creation story was very dense. It was, it was a difficult read, but it was filled with all kinds of information. Well, my cousin John, he uh, decided to kind of do an annotated version of that story. And so he went about creating a book, self-published, uh, you know, taking the, the Iroquois creation story and making it, a, I guess, into a little bit more 
digestible format. And um, so using that as the basis for the film, I began to you know, hire our, uh, our, well, like our singers, our dancers, uh, people who are really good speakers in my view. And, and then we got a grant and I, I went to work with this, uh, this dance group called the Garth Bagan Dance Group. Garth Bagan um, was very instrumental in the original Lion King on Broadway. He was, the, he was one of the uh, choreographers for the Lion King. And so, um, so Garth uh, he wanted to team up with us. And so the Garth Bagan dancers are in here in the live performance. And then our old uh, Iroquois dancers are in there as well. And, um, and so I, you know, I hired, I wanted to hire our own people so that people would, when they heard their voices, they would recognize their, their voice a lot, in a lot of cases. And, um, and, you know, might really keep their interest in the film. And, and it's only 22 minutes long, but I, I really wanted to uh, introduce the story. So now in the meantime, what's happened is, um, I want to do a completely Onondawa Gawano version of this. In other words, the, an entire creation story in our language. And so I've been working with a, with a group of women who are uh, fluent speakers on our Allegheny territory. And uh, it's taken a while, but in the meantime, uh, one of those language teachers took the John Arthur Gibson story and the John Mohawk story, and she put together what she called the concise version of this. So now we got three versions of this. But what she really dug into was the meaning behind each of the characters, the deeper meaning of each of the characters that are, that are in the story, in the Iroquois creation story. And so one of the things she wanted to emphasize to me was, this is a story of two twins. They go about making the earth the way you and I understand it, the way you and I experience it today. And these two twins are constantly wrestling with us, with our, with us. It's it's the force for destruction and you know the negative and the force for good and the and creation and the making of human beings, you know, the positive. And this these forces that are still struggling, you know, to control the earth are ever present. And and she wanted to make a point of the fact that these uh, the left-handed twin that we call in English uh, Flint, that he, he's like out to see us destroy ourselves. Really. He's, he really is a, a destructive force that is impacting our people yet today. You know? And so and so that's what she wanted to emphasize was um, you know, that these forces are at play and that they're still they're still plaguing us, I guess you could say. So so that was, you know, so it's a big story, right? I mean, it's like, how did the world come to be the way it is? And we have a, what we call a Thanksgiving address. In our language, they want the known now. Meaning we're giving thanks for all of our relatives that are supporting our way of life, that our career has provided for all living things. And so, um, so that parallels with this creation story. It, it really, they, they fit together. And so, even though we don't have like an annual recitation of the creation story, we use De Wadenonio to open all of our gatherings, uh, whether it's a ceremonial gathering or a social gathering. Uh, and, and, and we also call it Ganonio, which is just the Thanksgiving address. And so, uh, so that's the way we start all of our gatherings. And we acknowledge the people, we acknowledge the earth, the waters, we acknowledge the medicine plants, we acknowledge the four legged, we acknowledge the Foods have been placed here on the earth for our use. Um, we acknowledge the uh, winged creatures, we acknowledge the trees, we acknowledge the winds, the thunder beams, our elder brother, the sun, our grandmother, the moon, the stars, the rain, the uh, messengers who have come with instructions of how we're supposed to live as a human being, and one special uh, prophet, uh, we call him Hansel Lake in English, Daniel Dayu. And he was given a message in the year 1799 called the Woodward that really provides us with guidance. And so, you know, that's how we open with that and we close with that. So that we're always reminded of our connection to this world, this natural world that we're in. And so, as I say, the creation story, it, it lays out how these things came, when they came. And, and uh, so we're always, whenever we recite that, we're really, also referring back to the creation story. So, um, 
So anyway, I, I started, I was in New Zealand uh, with a whole group of artists from all over, They're from Hawaii, from New Zealand, from Northwest Coast here, from um, a guy from England, and people from Oklahoma, and, you know, various places, and New Mexico as well. And uh, so I started doing these drawings while I was down there. I had a pad of black paper and I kept knocking out drawings. And the main thing I was doing the drawings for, I was doing drawings for the animators because these were graduate students that did this animation, but they didn't have any knowledge of our cultural tradition. And they came from all over. They were Philippine, they were Iraqi, they were you know, American, they were from all various places. But they were attending this place called the Rochester Institute of Technology. And so we, we had got an agreement with the, with the director of the uh, school to, to do this animated film. And, um, and so I had, every, every time they had a question, I would, instead of writing an answer, I would do a drawing, take a phone, you know, picture of my phone and send it over to them. And so I did about 100 drawings. And these are just some of those drawings that I you know, produced. To, to answer questions that the animators had. Um, and, and then I kept on going, you know, I just kept on making more drawings. So I mean, even after the film was done, I, like this big one here, that was kind of, film was completed at that point. So what, the, what this one is about, you know, is these are the two twins. On the left, we have the uh, order of the heavens, and on the right, we have Flint. And, um, and they're in this constant struggle with each other. And the only thing that Flint fears is the deer antler. And so over the heavens is you know, this deer antler. Flint comes flying to God. And um, then, and they were like, they were so powerful, they could pick up mountains and throw them at each other. And, you know, they're, and, they're, and so eventually in this film it says this, that over the heavens had to call upon the power of earthquake to subdue his brother, because his brother was determined to destroy everything that the uh, holder of the heavens could make. He couldn't make people. He could make furry things, and he could make monstrous looking things, but he couldn't make humans. Whereas his brother could make humans from the earth. And that's, you know, that's part of our story, is we're made from the earth. And so, so I wanted to capture that. And, and the holder of the heavens, he made the first light, and the first light was uh, a sunflower. And then he also made, we call it the red willow, which is a medicine plant. And then he made the bluebird, the color and song. And so I, you know, I kept following that idea too, uh, of what they made and what the contrast is. And you know, the creator provided for us the white-tailed deer as food. We didn't have any domestic animals. We, you know, we really uh, were hunters. And, and we were trappers and gatherers. And, you know, and the women were the agriculturists. Uh, and this guy of Turtle Man, you know, this Turtle Man um, appears to, well, you know, again, the whole story begins in a world above this world, a world that we call, you know, the Sky World. And in the Sky World, there was a tree in the center of the Sky World, it was called the Celestial Tree. And this tree had, was the source of light, it was the source of food, it was the source of everything, really. Flowers, and, you know, beautiful aromas and things. And it began to wither, and it was clear that something was happening. And there was a guy who was the guardian of the trees, and he had been given a dream. And the dream was that life had to leave that part because that world, because that world was dying, and a new a new place had to be started. Life had to you know, move to a new place and begin again. And um, and that's this earth, but in this world. Life is not forever. In the sky world, life was eternal until that time period when, when things began to wilt. And Sky Woman, this, this Sky Woman, in the, the umbrella there, Sky Woman is plummeting. And she, the one thing she encounters, the, the one who guessed the dream of the uh, holder of the heaven, of the, excuse me, of the guardian of the tree, was a comet. He was both a comet and he was a man. And so there's a drawing back there of a Kind of a man who's both uh, a, a cat and a comet and a man. He's like three things. And he guides her down to the back of this turtle. The turtle appears in the water. This is Sky Moon. This is Holder. This is the guardian of the trees, Dwight. 
And the way they consummated their, their marriage when they got together, they pressed the soles of their feet together. And from that, she became pregnant. And so when she was pushed out of the sky world to come here, uh, she was bearing twins. And that's these twins that come out of her. And um, this is such a complicated story, I know I kind of went back, back toward there. But, but that's what it's, this is what the drawings are about. It's about this creation story. And there are the sacred aspects I have to leave out, you know, uh, in the film, just touch on this a little bit, uh, because naturally the, the sacred, we don't, we, don't make that a, we don't make that into a public kind of a forum. We, we retain that for our communities to, um, to maintain our way of life. But, um, but I really, you know, felt that, um, and this is what I'm really happy about. I just want to say on the side here. Our kids love this film. When they come to Finland again, when they come to visit, but under whatever circumstances, I always know where to find them when they're not wrong. They're in the orientation theater watching this film. Watching it over and over again, and you know, they, they're into it. <laughs> And that's what I wanted to happen, you know, was for our children to start thinking about these things and have them become, have it become a part of their understanding. Because when I was growing up, there wasn't any of this, right? All the things I'm talking about, I had to find, I had to learn about them. Now, we're doing a bigger, we're doing a lot better. I mean, we, we really have really worked on language retention and, and uh, you know, Acknowledging and honoring those who speak our language. And so today, we have 30 year olds and we have 20 year olds that are more fluent than I am. And we have 40 year olds, you know, that are fluent speakers. I would say they're right at the edge of the fluency. So, so we've come a long way because we were, we looked at it, we were right on the edge of losing, losing our language. And fortunately, we had enough people who, you know, saw this coming. One man, he created something called the Faith Weaver School, and he started with young children, and he made sure that they got really a lot of language at the same time that they were learning, you know, what would be required when they went on to high school, for example. Um, so, so anyway, but then they would also learn uh, what we call, what we call, it, the way of life of the real human being, the, the ceremony of our, of our way of life. Um, so, so we, you know, I, I, I feel confident that our things are going to continue, are going to go on, and, and, um, and our art should, should go on too. Our art should be part of this uh, continuing of who we are and maintaining our way of life. So, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I kind of covered the things I want to cover, but are there, any, are there any questions or any comments or any uh, thoughts that anybody has? I'd, I'd really rather do that than just keep talking. No, yeah, go ahead. I know some of you are dosed. Can you say something about the picture right next to you? This one here. Yeah, yeah so again, this is the struggle of um, the two twins. The one on the left is the uh, twin that is the left handed twin, and the one on the right is the right handed twin. and you know, the, the right-handed twin was able to make the deer, was able to make the sunflower for light, was able to make medicine, and we consider the wild strawberry for medicine. One on the left, he could make um, spiders, and he could make bats, and he could make, he made some fierce creatures, you know, that, I mean, and again, there's nothing wrong with a wolf. The wolf is, you know, the wolf has his own instincts, and he has to eat. Um, but, you know, so there's this struggle, I mean, the, of these forces that you know that, that exist even in the animal world, uh, and, and so uh, so that's what it's about, you know. And and the face on the far left is our grandmother, our grandmother Moon. Our grandmother Moon plays such an important role. We, we talk about our grandmother Moon gives women a cycle by which they bring forth life into this world. She controls the tides, and our ceremonial calendar is set according to our grandmother. So all of that. You know, she has all those responsibilities to see. And so anyway, these two forces are, are constantly kind of struggling with each other. But that's what that one is about. And, uh, 
and the different things that they were able to make. Uh, when you see the film, you'll see flint meat. This is one of the things that kind of people are surprised to hear us say or talk about. That it's really generally believed that human beings and these dinosaurs, these different creatures, existed at different times. That, they, that we were not here when they were here. And yet we have an acknowledgement of these beings. We, we know these beings who have been here. That's that, that drawing is back there where the camera is, is there's these creatures that are, you know, they're, they're no longer here. But we, we know the force that is holding them in the ground, where they went. And we think about that, and we talk about that, you know. Um, and so, um, so, again, there's things... So this whole thing, you know, the, the, what that even suggests then is this, that because most people think we came from someplace in Siberia and we came over the polar gap and we wound up, you know, uh, inhabiting North America, Central America, and South America. That's not our story. Our creation story begins here in North America. And, and you know, we talk about um, a time period that is... We don't know how long ago this was. All these things were taking place. But we have been here for a long, 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 long time. You know, I, I went to a site. It's in western Pennsylvania. And it's called Meadowcroft. And there was an archaeologist who worked on that site. And uh, his name is James Adebisio. So we, we went to see him because we really liked what he was saying. First thing he was saying was, this is a site that would be west of Pittsburgh. And, um, and that site, he has dated at 45,000 years old. 45,000 years old, okay? So anything about the ice cap and the rest of that, which is 10, 15,000 at the outside or 16,000 years, he's talking about something way, way, way before that. And, um, you know, he dated everything. There was a there was an overhanging cliff, like that it's called a rock shelter, Meadow Croft. And this overhanging cliff was used by people for generations and generations as a place of shelter and a place where they would eat, you know, build a fire and cook. And so he kept going down through the ashes and down and down and down, you know, and that's what he came back with this one dating of forty five thousand years old. And the only other one I've ever heard dated like that same time frame is in uh, Chile. Uh, and that one is uh, Montevideo. And so, again, I just say um, there's a lot that we don't know, but there's also our oral tradition. And at Ganon, again, we place an equal importance on our oral tradition, the European written record and maps and all that stuff that they created, and then archaeology. And that the three have to be given equal weight. So, so the oral tradition is still a valid tradition, an important tradition, but we need to learn it. We need to find it and you know, begin to understand it. And so that's what I'm hoping this is sort of generated, at least within my community, it's sort of generated this uh, thinking about it. Anybody, any other questions? Sure. Uh, I created about 100 drawings. And there's four that will be in the gift shop available for sale. And then these are a small part of them, of the ones that were in our orientation theater at the center. And there's probably another, um, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 that are still at the uh, orientation theater, in the orientation theater. Um, and a lot of them I, I didn't frame up. Some of them were real short, I mean, real quick pieces that were done. Um, but you know, the one thing I, and I, well, and then I did a mural, and the mural is um, uh, 16 feet long and, and 8 feet high, uh, again, taking all of the, the parts, and uh, the mural is still looking for a home. <laughs> I've had so many conversations about that, where it's going to go, and um, the city of Rochester has some interest in still working with them to make that happen, I guess. But yeah, it's about a long time period. 
Um, well, I started in 2014, and like I said, I was in New Zealand, and I was filling up these notebooks with drawings. And then, then when we really got down to serious work with the, with the uh, animators, then I was doing, you know, like I said, whenever they would run into a question, I would do more. So really, they they started uh, from 2014 to 2015. So really, over only a year. But then I kept doing them. So, for example, like this one here, I, the, the big one, I think that might have been um, 2017 when I did that one. And then I think the umbrella in the back is about 2007. So you can see there was some doing some beforehand, thinking about it, and then you know getting down to really work on the film. Yes? So what inspired you to work with paper, like a paper bag? Uh, Okay, this is a funny one. Um, I, uh, I was sitting in my office when I was running the gallery and I was doodling on a lunch bag, right? And there was an exhibit that was being put together in Times Square of New York City, right? But this was like done by, it was a combination of all kinds of artists that were gonna be in that exhibit. The guy who was the curator for the exhibit happened to come by the gallery and he saw me drawing on my lunch bag and I had done a little bit of this kind of stuff before, but not much. But he said, I really like that. He goes, can you do some more of those? So for this show called the Times Square Show. So now I'm gonna to get to the part that's kind of the truth part. It, it was in a former massage parlor, right? <laughs> and it was three floors of a building right off uh, 42nd Street on 41st Street. And um, like I said, there were street artists, and then people who became really famous people, like Jean-Michel Basquiat, and um, Keith Haring, and um, what's that other guy's name? I uh, can't think of it right now. Anyway, all these artists were involved, Cindy Rupp, and there, there were a whole bunch of them, and Charlie Ahern, his brother John. Uh, Charlie was the curator. And it, anyway, so, so I had shown these paper bags, and people liked the bags, and they kept asking me to do more of them. And um, what I realized was, I could, if I put, if I did a large shopping bag, I could graduate the size of the bags and I could transport an entire show on the subway, <laughs> you know, carrying a shopping bag. And so when I get to the gallery, I just take out the other bags that were inside there and you know, they would make an arrangement out of them. And the, the second show I was in, I got into an argument with my wife and she, not this, Young lady here. <laughs> Someone was in the smoke. Uh, anyway. So she would not let me back in the apartment, right? So I didn't have the show. So I literally had to create the show overnight. I just, she kept bringing out paper bags that she had and art materials. And so I worked overnight and, like, I literally did that. I put everything in one shopping bag got on a subway and took the show to where I had to deliver and they had left the space in the gallery for me to, for them to put it in. You know. Anyway, so then what happened was every time I was in a show, the art critics would always write about the paper bags because they were unusual. No matter if I had drawings or paintings or whatever else I had, they would write about the paper bags. And most of the time it was like, you know, they couldn't figure it out and they didn't know what to say exactly, but they were interested. Only one time did I really get slammed. Well, twice I got really slammed because of paper bags. Once in Denver and once in Scottsdale. They hated them. <laughs> the critics hated them. So, so I had to deal with that too. But most of the time it's, it's been kind of a positive. And then uh, in New York, just this last year in 2018, they, they recreated a show I was in back in, uh, gosh, 1986. They redid that show. And so I had to borrow back old bags from people who had bought from me back then. Because of course, nobody wanted to buy a paper bag either. So I didn't understand that. I had a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people were buying paper bags, you know. But I have to say this, the Whitney Museum bought a paper bag. And added it to their collection. It's in there right now. <laughs> Just keep doing whatever you're doing and it might catch up to you. <laughs> Go ahead. This is a 
different topic. Go ahead. But I wonder, can you say a little bit more about the role of the turtle and the place in the in the cosmic yeah. sort of view okay. of, of so, what the turtle is and does? Yeah. So um, so in this story, again looking back at the at the uh, umbrella the parasol, I used to say parasol. So when Sky Woman was plummeting toward a, a watery surface, um, a turtle appeared in the water to catch her. The water birds flew up to catch her on their back, and then they were going to bring her down to the back of the turtle. But as they were you know, bringing her down, they realized that the turtle's back was not really big enough. But he was offering it, the big sea turtle was offering his back. So Muskrat dove down to the bottom of the ocean, and he grabbed a tiny paw full of dirt, and he brought it up, and he placed it on the back of the turtle. And Sky Woman, when she landed there, she danced a song that our women still dance today. We call it Escanye, Escanye Gainose, which is a women's shuffle dance. And as she danced that and spread that earth around the turtle, the turtle's back got bigger and bigger until it formed North America. That's what we say. Turtle Island. And so the, the back of the turtle became Turtle Island. And the turtle has a lot of significance to us because of the number of shells of, I should say, the, I don't know what you call them, but the spaces around the outside of the, of the shell makes 28. And that's, each moon is 28 days apart. And um, the, um, and then the turtle is also for us a, a, a clan. We have four on the bird side, and we have four on the animal side, and the turtle is one of our clans on the animal side. So the, the turtle has a lot of significance, and, and there are rattles made from the turtle, so there's a lot of, a lot of meaning for, for us. Yeah. Um, well, maybe we've kind of reached the end, but I thank you all for taking the time to come tonight, and Walker, thank you for taping this, maybe other interpreters and docents will find it useful. Um, and if you want, uh, we talked about playing the film, if you have some time to stay and, and see the film in its entirety. I, you know, I really should thank a lot of people who were involved. Brent Michael Davis produced the original music uh, from some songs that I heard a man say by the name of Avery Jimerson create. Um, and um, Joanne Shenandoah is one of our nader, narrators. Clayton Logan is a narrator. Bill Krauss, some of you may have seen him. He performs with the Allegheny River Dancers. Bill Krauss is a singer in this. And, and lots of other people uh, were, were involved. Uh, so that's it, down into it.